Hello and good day everyone. Welcome to our podcast Find Your Feet. This is your host Ajay Bakshi. I'm also a business owner and entrepreneur based out of Perth, Western Australia. This podcast gives me a chance to interview some of the most amazing and enterprising people to learn about their life-changing journey as an immigrant. It allows me to get into their head to understand their life philosophy, hacks and how did they make it happen in their own unique way. These are some very highly self-motivated people who slogged their way and proved to be the best in what they have done and achieved. Their stories are real, inspiring and worth listening to and learning from. I believe and so does all our guests that their success stories will inspire more and more people to turn around their present circumstances and create a better future for themselves and their families. Remember, this podcast is for the immigrants by the immigrants and for the betterment of immigrant community as a whole. So, subscribe to our podcast at your favorite podcast app and share it with your friends and family or with anyone who you think will get benefit from it. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, feel free to send an email to us at findyourfeedpodcast@gmail.com. Thank you very much and enjoy the podcast. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Find Your Feet. This is your host Ajay Bakshi and with me today I have a very special person Sarab Singh. Sarab is not only a great friend of mine, he is also a very able coach and mentor. He runs his own organization in Perth called Corporate Sherpas and we are going to discuss with him why he calls it Corporate Sherpas. He is also CEO of Illuminate Group. Sarv specializes in capability and leadership development in his client's organization to enhance employee engagement, retention and productivity. Sarv is happily married to Jasmine and they have two lovely kids. Like Sarv, Jasmine too is an enterprising young person who manages and runs her own restaurant business called The Mango Tree. All right, uh, Sarv, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Ajay. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your hospitality and the, the lovely whiskey and, and this chance to have a chat. Fantastic. Now, jumping straight to the point, you have a consulting business. It's called Corporate Sherpas. Mm-hmm. What does that mean exactly? Corporate Sherpa, yeah. Uh, the, the whole, uh, the name kind of gives it away. Um, the, the story I, I, I was thinking about is um, we, we all know about Edmund Hillary, so Edmund Hillary, who, who climbed Everest in, in 1953, um, celebrated man, got knighted. Uh, everyone knows what a courageous, good achievement it was. It's a lofty goal as, as it was tried many, many years ago. People failed, uh, but he made it. Uh, the lesser known fact about that, that expedition was he also had a, um, a Sherpa with him. His name was Tenzing Norge. Uh, since Tenzing Norgay has also been knighted, so he's also Sir Tenzing Norgay. Uh, but the the thought process behind that was, why don't we um, start a business that actually is truly dedicated to people and the success? Uh, we are a coaching, consulting, leadership uh, business, but I think the, the whole point of it was, let's do it for others. Let's actually dedicate ourselves to betterment and uh, of others businesses as well as in fact taking people to their uh, their peaks as well so hence hence the corporate sherpa name was born oh fantastic now coming back to the podcast this podcast is uh, for the migrants by the migrants so what is your background what kind of migrant you are well i i was a unwilling migrant <laughs> <laughs> So I, um, uh, we moved here when I was 15. So the family moved here, mum, dad, uh, elder brother, younger sister, uh, and the middle child. So as children, we didn't really have a choice of moving or not. Uh, initially, we thought, well, no, let's give it a go. It'll be, it'll be good fun. Um, this was many, many years ago, though. Um, so this was, I'm talking about 1987. Oh wow! So that's uh, that's when migration wasn't uh, talked about as much, um, and mum um, and dad had the opportunity to come here. Um, there's a few things that happened back back in India, 
uh, in '84 and yeah. and since, um, and I think the they must have some kind of a spark gone on in Dad's brain to kind of just go. Uh, he's witnessed that when India and Pakistan were separated, um, and then maybe he just thought, "Okay, like, let's 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 create something for for kids that uh, that." We don't encounter something that uh, he had to a couple of times in his life. So, why Australia? How Australia happened? Well, my uncle uh, uh, was living here prior, so his younger brother, my dad's younger brother, was here, and uh, he he said, uh, "No, you've got to come up here." So he was uh, he was in Perth, and that's where we came. We came to Perth, and um, so we had no choice but to come to Perth. Cool. And then you joined the uh, school here. And yes, yes. So um, we came and lived with our with our uncle for the first uh, couple of months. Um, that was in September '87. We came, and uh, within uh, a week, uh, I went to uh, Duncraig High School. So it's a suburb in. Well, in those days, um, Duncraig and Sorrento were kind of the edge of of the population. Oh. So Sorrento was a new suburb, and. Um, I remember my first few first few days, first few weeks, first few years in in Dunkirk High School. So yes, I, I still classify myself as a Dunkirk High boy. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Now, when a young migrant kid comes to a place like Australia and go to a school, and especially when you came, mm-hmm. it must have been all white school and very few migrants there. So. Any uh, story of that time? Of course, of course. See, I was uh, I was the only uh, turban wearing, uh, patka wearing Sadarji. Uh, okay. So that was uh, um, that was unusual for for mainly um, a white Caucasian kind of a, um, a society of, of of school. I mean, for those who who, who don't know, Dan Craig and Sorrento are. Uh, uh, the northern beaches of, of Perth. Uh, well, in those days, there were northern beaches of Perth. And uh, so predominantly, we, we had a lot of people from UK and uh, and Perth, but there, there weren't any uh, migrants from, from Asia as such, uh, let alone India. And so um, the only thing that they had heard of was Bishan Singh Bedi. Uh, <laughs> cricket. Who, who, the cricket, yeah. that's right. So who uh, who wore a turban and, and some, some people knew of him, and uh, that's how they associated me as, um, you know, like, do you play cricket? Okay. Of course you <laughs> Of course I play cricket. Even so. if you don't play, you would say, <laughs> I play. <laughs> it's in our blood. We, we, yeah. we as Indians are born with it, I yeah, guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, look, let me just share a couple of stories of, of, of school. Uh, I was, I was um, sharing this with mum uh, the other day, and in, in fact, I'll tie it up with... Um, coping with change and resilience as well, right? So um, on the first few days of, of school, um, so the, the friends that I had, uh, they said, uh, you know, okay, Bishan Singh Bedi we've heard of, so do you play cricket? Yes, uh, yes, I do. They said, do you play footy? I said, what is that? Um, yeah. I said, okay, never mind. Do you play tennis? I go, no, but I've seen it. Uh, do you play soccer? I said, no, but I play football. And they go, no, it's called soccer. So anyway, and they go, do you, buy, do you ride a bike? I said, yes, I ride a bike. And they said, do you swim? I said, nope, I, I don't swim. And they go, what? You don't swim? And I go, no, I'm, we don't. I come from a landlocked country, and you know, New Delhi, is. Uh, there's not many swimming pools for us to, to learn swimming. Uh, they go, no, no, we'll teach you. So they go, ride your bike to the beach, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll teach you. So the moral of the story is never to trust 15-year-old boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I went there uh, on the beach. It was still September, and it was bitterly cold. It was yeah. The beach was cold. The water was cold. I went in waist deep, and, uh, and, and my close friends, they still are my close friends, and they said, okay, let's go in. And, uh, and as I edged forward, uh, suddenly the... Um, the sand and and you know the, the ground gave way, and and I was kind of flapping everywhere and, and trying to grab hold of, of their arms and whatnot, and then I thought this this is this is no fun right <laughs> this the swimming part is overrated because there's sand everywhere and it's cold and I said what there's no enjoyment part, 
And uh, they said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. And then suddenly I, I realized these waves started coming. And these waves would come and they would kind of just wash all over me, the face, the, the head and everything. I'm going, yeah, what's, what the hell's going on? This is, this is an absolute disaster. And one of my close friends there, he's, his name was Leet. Leet said, um, okay, sir, what you do is when you see a big wave, um, you need to duck down, uh, close your eyes, close your mouth, duck, and let the wave uh, pass all over you. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's a lot of fun. So uh, in the end, um, I said, okay, let's, let's try that. So one, two, three waves came, and, and I was actually having a chat with him the other day, and I said, do you remember this, that good advice that you gave me? Um, that when, when waves come, right, um, duck down, close your eyes, and let it wash all over you. And I said, there's one more thing, though, that although that is known as how you deal with waves, uh, I said, but I would, I would rather be not the Sarab of 15-year-old uh, Sarab, but I'd rather be 15-year-old Leet, who, uh, as a as Sarab, I didn't know how to swim those waves. But what I saw in Leet was he was loving the waves. The bigger the waves, the more exhilaration he was getting. No fear. No fear. In fact, he found exhilaration in that. And I think that now, uh, that story fits perfectly with us now, is that when the world is becoming uh, uncertain, fast-moving, uh, unpredictable, unpredictable, complex, ambiguous, volatile, whatever you want to call it, this is the time to be really good swimmers and surfies. Uh, Enjoy the tough waves, survive them through. Exactly. And you will emerge stronger. And, and, and actually approach it with some, some vigor and, yeah. and with some confidence. And uh, I, I think we were taught to uh, duck down and let it pass through. But I think there's, an, there's another pleasure out of that. Yeah. I think life is an experiment. Yeah. Um, so when, when failure happens, um, I say, well, I don't fail. Uh, the experiment failed. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So what, what can we learn from that? You know, it's a scientist's approach of... Um, well, what's, what's, the, what's the experiment here um, and, and what can I learn? Yeah. Perfect. So now uh, one of the qualities that you just mentioned, I'm trying to interpret that as a young child who came from India, a very unique child in his own class, uh, somebody who was different than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but you had a quality of embracing the change and going along with the, let's say, waves or your friends I think that's one uh, uh, quality that has probably helped you s uh, smoothly pass through your school without any, you know, incident. Yes, look, I, I think I was... Uh, flexibility uh, is, is something that, that I, I know I have uh, uh, loads of and something that I pride and I, I teach my kids the same is, is how to sort of be flexible. And, and take things as they come and, and respond to them. Yep. Um, so I was, I was never the, uh, the brightest child. I was, I was not the, as they call, uh, the sharpest knife in the, in the drawer. Right? <laughs> so. <laughs> but you were highly adaptable to the changing scenario of your personal life. And I think that helped. So if you have to give advice to a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old child who's coming with his parents, tagging along with the parents and coming to a foreign country like, say, Australia or Canada, yeah. I think this is a very good advice that be flexible, adapt to the changing scenario and go all out. In, in fact, uh, first of all, part of that question is if they come to Canada or, or Australia, I think if there is a choice, they should all come to Australia. That's, that's oh, yeah. number one, right? Yeah. Um, my, my advice to a 15-year-old is very simple, is not just uh, be flexible, but try everything, right? So volunteer for everything that you can, you can try your hand at. We, that is a quality that, that often is, is overlooked. Um, we, you're right that uh, often success and outcomes are overrated, and the learning is almost always undervalued. Right. So there is a, as human beings, I mean, this is my field, is human behavior and, and um, neuroscience of it. We, we know for a fact that 
in business and in life, we overestimate the value of success and outcomes, and we underestimate the value of learning. So we, uh, certainly from, from my very personal perspective, uh, I think anyone coming, anyone wanting to come um, anywhere or start something new, um, you've, you've got to be confident and comfortable with failure, uh, but you must allow yourself to volunteer and try out different things. What happens is we, uh, as we're growing up, right, so we're all born with, with I, I call this, you know, in our, in our fields, so a growth and fixed mindset. So the growth mindset is one that is, you know, it's a person who keeps trying everything all the time. And, and the core belief is, I can learn anything. Right? But a fixed mindset person, or a fixed mindset approach is one that uh, the core belief is, I'm born with certain skills, and now I have to prove that I can exercise or reach my outcomes. Right? So what ends up happening is you only focus on outcomes, and you'll only try things that you think you can achieve. The world is not like that anymore. Correct. Yeah. And the word is experiment. Try and experiment with everything. It, it's the best way to learn. Yeah. All right. So moving on to uh, your university. So what happened after school? Okay. So um, university uh, straight after school was a disaster for me. How come? Um, I was not a good student to start with. Then there was no discipline uh, around universities. Um, so my academic record was was shabby is a, is a, is the best compliment I can give it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was no teachers, nobody holding you accountable. Uh, it was uh, full musty. <laughs> uh, and um, and actually for us uh, through through family, uh, stuff. Dad got very ill when, when um, uh, straight after we moved here. So that meant that we all had to work. So work and earning money was a priority rather than attending lectures and tutorials and doing assignments and sitting exams. So the undergraduate part of, of my university was, um, uh, was I am sure, no, I'm not promoting this, but it was prob I was probably the, one of the worst students I've still come across ever. Um, having said that, the postgraduate stuff uh, is something that, that um, I turned things around and I was very proud of it. And um, So I got a chance to uh, do my master's at ANU and um, after the, the first six months, in fact, I got a scholarship from uh, both Customs and Border Protection that, that uh, I used to work at, uh, as well as from ANU. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, I both, saw that on your profile. Both of them offered me a scholarship to do my master's. So, uh, just mm -hmm. uh, one second on that part. So, you were not a very academically intelligent student, mm -hmm. but then you went on to achieve scholarships and all the accolades. As I say, we, the Australian culture, there's a bias for good performance. right? So, there's a bias for hard work and diligence and endeavor. So you don't have to be academically bright. You don't have to be um, book smart necessarily. You just, you just have to be hardworking enough and pay attention enough and, uh, uh, and have a learning uh, orientation. So um, we, we, in, in, again, in our world, we call it super chickens and average flock, yeah. right? <laughs> so I was not a super chicken. Uh, I was an average flock, and um, and I think it, it, certainly in Australia, um, you are, are judged on your learning orientation because I think the the jobs and the the work for tomorrow is not yet created, right? So yeah. you have to have the ability to learn, and I think that's that is one thing that differentiates between uh, what I think of of traditional India that I grew up in. And they're saying, okay, you need you need to have certain amount of marks to for you to get access to certain amount of opportunities, and uh, and look, my elder brother went through that, where he uh, he knew if if he didn't score ninety eight point five percent or or higher, he wouldn't get into IIT and this that or the other, and I think that was his world, right? 
um, that never applied to me. So, <laughs> so uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I think one important factor that a lot of parents have in their mind while you know moving to um, leaving their country and moving to developed country like Australia or anywhere else is that how their children will get adjusted to the new education system. And that's a very good point that you made that you don't necessarily need to have only academically bright mind. If you are inquisitive and if you want to try out new subjects or new opportunities, there is no dearth of it. Absolutely. Look, I, I think um, I am sure in, in modern India, modern Australia, modern world, um, the, the most important attributes for a young person or a, or a parent looking at, at raising children uh, is that you, we have to engender a sense of curiosity uh, and, and a learning orientation in our kids. Um, that, that is uh, personal advice and professional advice, if you want to call it that. Um, and, and look, books and, and pure ac uh, academic kind of scores um, they only tell you, yes, you can actually apply yourself and learn and, and execute on, on your memory. Um, so I think with, with the advent of, of machines and this out of the other, what we actually need is um, people with higher levels of emotional quotient or the emotional intelligence that connect with others, uh, are able to form relationships. So I think that's what I have taken as my uh, pathway to... Uh, to betterment of my life, I guess. Very nice. Now, uh, you also mentioned that you, uh, during your uni days, you were working as well? Mm -hmm. So, yes. in Australia, is it possible for a university undergrad student to work and study simultaneously and sponsor his own education? Uh, of course, yes. I, I think that's what, what modern... Um, Australia looks like now. I, th I think uh, nearly every student um, has some kind of a job. In fact, any serious employer would, that's what they would look at is what, what was your uh, academic score and, and what you did and also what you did for, uh, for a work perspective, right? So it would, even if you didn't get a paid job, did you volunteer for anything? And gain experience. Gain experience. Yeah. So can you connect with people? Like we, we don't want to... As employers, we don't want to hire super bright people who can't operate the, the photocopy machine, uh, <laughs> yeah. can't make a coffee for themselves, uh, and can't have a laugh. So that defeats the whole, that's a big risk for any workplace, yeah. right? So uh, I think to answer your question, yeah, absolutely, everyone does. In fact, my story was um, that I've started working since the age of... Um, in fact, I was 15 uh, when I first got my job. I used to get uh, uh, paid $25 for working the whole day. Uh, wow. So that was... And that was 1992 or three? No, that was, that was in 87, 1987. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I actually worked um, every weekend of my uh, year 8, year 9, year 10, year 11, and year 12. So I've, um, I have known work... Um, um, and I associate work on weekends. So I, I didn't get the privileged uh, life that some of the other kids um, or, or my, my friends got. Uh, we, we had no choice but to work as a migrant family. And that's all. That's sometimes that's how the cookie crumbles as well. So yeah. uh, no regrets. In fact, I've, I, I've learned the most um, through those opportunities that I was given. So sport is the best way to learn about teams and leadership. And that's what we know. The yeah. best way to keep your your physical hygiene, your mental hygiene, your emotional hygiene, um, and, I, and I think it's a it's a fantastic thing that that um, we all do. We the sport is a big thing here. So yeah. um, my six year old he, he plays five or six sports a week, and and he's a sports addict. So and I'm enjoying that. So he's he's a bit like me. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I don't want to frame him, but um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he may not be the uh, the the sharpest knife in the toolbox again, but but certainly he'll uh, he'll give a sport uh, a go. But I do want to connect one thing uh, with that. Ajay, is is um, look, I, I in my profession I deal with lots of CEOs, lots of very successful uh, people at the top of their game from a 
business perspective um, and and those men and women that I that I interact with that I meet um, I I can guarantee you not one of them is purely academic not one of them kind of all rounder personalities yeah, yeah not one of them is they only on the basis of their uh, intellectual horsepower right so the the IQ side of things the intellectual horsepower side of things gets you to a certain level right it's almost in these days we say that's just a ticket to the game yeah right now to be successful at that game to actually really be fa- uh, fantastic at whatever you pursue you have to have the emotional quotient or the because otherwise that becomes a constraint for your success yeah so the whole opportunity here is to look at how do we create all round personalities out of ourselves and the people that we lead out of the people that we raise right it's like a wholesome development of uh, an individual 100% 100% one more uh, uh, interesting thing that i've observed uh, comparing it with uh, working in india or singapore i worked in japan also is that uh, starting time is let's say 8 o'clock in any office mm-hmm. but the end time varies in india we have people who work 12 hours a day or monday to saturday they work uh, but when i came to australia i saw uh, it's a very uh, unsaid rule that friday 4 pm or 5 pm everything stops and people go out go to the bars or pubs or go with their families to the beach and enjoy uh, that's one a very interesting aspect that you know uh, i realize is very unique to australia mm. yeah yeah look i, I think uh, we all have been chasing this this concept of work life balance yeah. right and it's different stages of life it becomes even more important uh, but i think it's a good realization that um, the whole concept around that is well why are you working right uh, what is it that you you really want to do in life in fact one of the, the the best stories i've i've been or bits best set of questions i was ever asked for was 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 along the lines of um do you know we an average person has got 30000 days to live like you and i and everybody else um we we actually only really have give or take a few about 30000 uh, days to live and out of that if we reflect back we go well how many of the, day, the those days have we already spent seriously i don't know what to think right? <laughs> you go well what what's what's left over yeah very little <laughs> right and then so what's left over you then have to figure out well how many weekends do i really have to enjoy life right work is one thing i work for something and what is it that something that i get to do whether it's on a weekend with the family or another pursuit that you've got so how many weekends do you really have another question if you want to get really serious about it is well how many of those are effective and how many of those are actually uh uh where you you be able bodied able minded and and experience life to the fullest and then how many summer holidays do you have left with your family so what is whatever that you want to enjoy let's be a bit more conscious about why are we working what is the end goal here and and where the focus should be i think it's a that. great philosophy to have mm-hmm. or right, coming back to um, so from uni you moved to the job mm. you started as a customs officer yes i did so any challenges you faced during uh, working there with regards to what you were as a migrant or was it smooth um Let, let me actually explain to you what happened my first day at customs that that will actually set this up um for everyone so as a 25 year old you know you think well that was your lucky break so uh, the the way i got into customs was interesting enough anyway so the in those days um we used to have these public service tests and uh i think 5000 people applied for it i got in as a top Uh, 100 to be interviewed i got uh, selected as number 2 uh, to join customs and customs only took 30 people as cadets 
uh, in that year. So I thought, well, customs, what would we do? Passports, uh, stamping at the airport, you know, that's that's one aspect of it. And uh, it's, a, it's a prestigious uh, uh, career and a profession. And uh, and I'm sure mum and dad, were, it was the proudest moment for them. So I didn't want to stuff it up, right? So the first day um, when I rocked up, um, we had the big brass of customs in, in, in WA and the collector uh, and everybody else who, who made their speeches. And and I remember the collector uh, or the head of, of customs picked up uh, a nice thick uh, uh, customs act. And, it, and the customs act still says 1901. <laughs> and he says, we are the, the oldest um, uh, organizations in Australia. We were one of the very first few that were formed. And uh, now uh, you young people are going to join it and take it forward. So it's up to you about, you know, to spoke about integrity, he spoke about property, he spoke about ethics and the responsibility for um, protecting the community. All right. So, uh, and that was an eye opener for me. What I thought of uh, customs as, as a, more of an administrative kind of a, a job, it wasn't. It, it turned out to be something that you actually dedicate yourself to. And so I was really pleased. So after the, the morning tea and the, you know, the sausage rolls and whatnot, they, they actually took us down to uh, the, the uniform store, where the uniform store was the basement of, of the customs house. And we were all lined up. Everyone was trying different shoes and socks and shirts. And you know, the, the tailors were there were measuring your, 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 uh, your uniform and, and whatnot. And one of the, the senior officers um, uh, came around and got me out of the line and said, um, Mr. Singh, uh, do you have five minutes? We, we'd like to have a chat with you. And of course, this, this was the best break that, that, that I've had. And as a 25-year-old, you, you're still full of anxieties. You just don't know what's going to happen. And I said, my goodness, I, I hope everything's okay. I hope they haven't changed their mind. I hope they haven't realized, oh my God, we didn't realize this guy you know, looks different. <laughs> how, how will he ever join the Australian Customs Service? As of, you know, he, he belongs in a different customs <laughs> service. So I, I had no choice in the matter, so I followed him, and I was ushered into a, a, a room down in the basement. And I remember a very large uh, wooden table, and there were four other officers there, all with uh, lots of lots of stripes on their shoulders and, and bands and badges and whatnot, and too many to, to count and too many to understand on my first day. And uh, then one of the senior officers... Um, put his hands on the table and said, uh, Mr. Singh, there is something very sensitive we would like to um, discuss with you. And then I was absolutely sure that I was, they've changed their mind, right? They said, this guy is, um, is not fit for us. He was possibly number 31. We only needed 30 and all those sorts of things. All those anxieties came. And uh, so I thought, <laughs> well, whatever will be. That's it. And I said, OK, I'm ready to, uh, to have a go. And so, so he reached back. He he reached back from from his chair, and uh, he pulled out a, a really big. Um, in those days, we used to call it a cork boards. So, put cork boards, and on the cork board he had, uh, I think, ten or twelve different swatches of cloths attached, pinned to it. And he said, uh, "Well, you are the first Sikh practicing Sikh customs officer." Australia. Wow. And uh, we have uh, we have researched um, uh, long and hard. Um, so what we found is um, um, the Indian police have decorated the, the turban uh, through a badge and a ribbon and the army does it this way, the Indian army does it this way. We've even investigated how the UK customs uh, officers, Sikh officers have, mm. have uh, addressed up. And he said, uh, but these are the colour swatches, uh, color, uh, color of turban that we can source in Australia because one of the things in, uh, a lot of people don't realise is uh, 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 an officer's uniform has to be made in Australia. So that was the rule at that point. It says these are the only coloured uh, of, of turbans we can actually source in Australia. And he said, we would like to give you the opportunity to choose select. Wow. And then I wore 
uh, I actually selected navy blue. And to this day, if you see me at work, uh, I still wear navy blue as my uh, uh, respect for what I was given in the late 90s. That's very, uh, uh, very incredible on part of uh, Australian customer service that they not only um, researched for a young cadet who was bottom of the pyramid uh, in hierarchy terms, uh, I think that's what they call it as a fair go, isn't it? It, it, it is. And look, with all the... See, what happens is the human brain likes to uh, hold on to um, more of the sensational um, viewpoints. Yeah. Right? Uh, all the negative stuff that happens to us, our brain is designed to actually hold on to it. So I'm... You know, first of all, thank you for, for the opportunity to sharing my experience of, of, you know, Australia and the racism that, that I encountered. Uh, I just want to very simply say, well, that's my story. That's, that's my view of what this country has, has done for me on my first day of, of serious work and, and ever since. Um, look, I, um, they gave me every opportunity to um, to go up the ranks. I, I resigned as a as a director, and look, it's a, it was an absolute privilege. And if anyone, whether whether in Australia or otherwise, um, don't know what they should do with their with their um, with their career, I, I that is that is an organisation I uh, highly recommend. I, Highly recommend, and not just that, Ajay, I, I, I identify with it as, as a core of who I am. So I'm a, I'm a um, product of the generosity. Connect. And I'm a product of, of the generosity of the leaders that, that I actually encountered in that, that organization. That's a very incredible story. Thanks for sharing that, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, from a customs officer to becoming an uh, entrepreneur, that's a pretty remarkable journey. How did that happen? What prompted it? <laughs> that seems to be a very <clears throat> interesting story. <laughs> yes, it was. I was in Canberra. I, I had, I had uh, promised Jasmine that we will only go for um, two years, two to three years maximum, and we'll be back in Perth. And uh, almost six years later, uh, she said, I don't think I can bear uh, another winter in Canberra. So that's something that you, <laughs> you have to uh, watch for. Um, but I, I, I think uh, uh, she, she was actually missing family. So she, she, we've always associated Perth as home. And, uh, and I think all roads led back to, um, to Perth as well. Dad wasn't well. Again, as he'll help. And I remember my brother calling me and, and saying, uh, look, Dad's, Dad's not happy because he said that's not the reason why he came to, to Australia. To have one son in Perth, one son in Canberra, and one daughter in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So he says, um, uh, you need to come back. So that's, that's kind of the step to go, okay, um, let's, let's see what, what, <clears throat> um, uh, what happened, what waits for us in Perth. And, and unfortunately for the position that I was in and the role that I was in in, in, in Canberra, uh, there was no equivalent role in, in Perth. And um, there was a few other uh, things as well, which which uh, I, I'd rather just leave it to the 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 offside, as they call it, the offstop. Um, but yeah, it was a decision made uh, on a holiday for Jasmine and I to say, okay, why don't we um, try this ourselves? Uh, and in fact, I just prior to that, um, A and U had offered me a, a job to um, lecture and become a professor at A and U. So that, that kind of sparked, uh, oh, wow, there could be another career outside of customs. And um, so I thought if, if A and U have uh, the confidence of saying, well, I could, I could do that job, maybe I can do it for myself. So that's, that's, that's where the risk came. And again, look, uh, the, the, the best advice I got from uh, my father at that point was um, very apt. He said, son, you, you've done so well. Um, uh, being on top of uh, this elephant and riding this elephant, which was the very mechanical, um, uh, structured customs organization. And he said, just imagine what you could be doing on top of a horse where you have a lot more leeway and a lot more flexibility. 
fantastic mm. so uh, it was a leap of faith and you have trust in the system that no matter what you try out the system is going to support you so if somebody has to start a business in australia is it difficult easy complex how is it it's all of that okay it is all of that some parts of it are easy some parts of it are complex some parts of it are very difficult um it, it it really just depends on your own orientation right so but i think from a uh from a business perspective or an entrepreneurship perspective i think that's that's the world expects us to um have a go right yeah. uh, and i think the the system is is set up for it um for for people to um find their passion and and find find their mark i think a lot of it is Uh, and I've seen both of it. Right? I, I've seen um, ones who are very steady, and they they just want to stay in those swim lanes, and and they they have a very set path um, to retirement and and bliss, if you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And there's others who go, well, no, I'm I won't be dying wondering. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for each one, according to their own wishes, yeah. It is. It is. And look, uh, I've I've had a taste of both. Um, I, I, from a from an emotional level, I connect with customs, but from a, a pure thrill and uh, uh, I guess uh, acknowledgement of of trying out different things, I I'm, I must say I enjoy my current role even more. So in your present role, you are helping companies um, develop their leadership skills and strategies, and then leading to productivity improvement, employee retention. uh what is what is the ailing industry in these times of pandemic and uncertainty is there anything that has changed between pre and uh, post pandemic levels or is it same story no no it, it it's uh well it, even before pandemic pandemic is part of a change that's that's been um, slowly occurring so um uh my my context to that ajay is um a lot we know a lot of businesses and a lot of companies that have thrived in what i call the age of um the industrial the, the industrial age right uh where the leader kind of uh is full of credibility and experience and and knowledge and so the leader has the answers and uh then the leader tells everybody what to do right so that's a very industrial way of kind of running a business and going well i know the answer and you shall do this from here on then we moved into what we called an information age right and and the information age gave way to hard data and hard uh, analysis and the teams were able to figure it out themselves right so the leader or the role of the leadership had changed from one person to um well informed um teams when we could make lots and lots of good decisions so but i think since 2017 uh the information age has now given way to the imagination age so we move from the industrial age to information age to now the imagination age where creativity and imagination are the levers of competitive advantage so uh certainly from a so pandemic is part of what we call a vuca uh, v u c a uh, vuca environment which is classified as volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous so as a law enforcement officer as customs this is this was our, our bread and butter so every time you open a bag every time you open somebody's you know um, ship you 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 went in and and you know broke down a door and did anything well it was volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous you just had to think on your feet at that time right now the business of more the corporate culture has come to that way you cannot sustain or even think about those five year plans right there is a direction but things can change 180 degrees in in 90 days absolutely so as you, we have seen that's right so you you have you have to respond to it so where we come from from a from if you say a more corporate sense or a corporate sherpa perspective is we i've 
growing up in customs, one thing that that was triggered in me is is this wonderment of, and I call it wonderment of why we think the way we think and why we behave the way we behave. So what is that human nature? What actually goes on in our brain? And so I have dedicated about 25 years of, of my life in, in pursuit of that. So uh, now we actually, within our, our workplace, we focus on uh, what is the neuroscience uh, evidence? What's the neuroscience research saying? What's the organizational psychology aspect of this? What is the human behavior expertise saying? What's the behavioral economics side of things saying? So uh, look, I've had the privilege of uh, of attending Harvard Business School and studying innovation in Boston. Uh, my, my colleague went to London School of Economics. And, and this is our world to kind of figure out, well, now that this age of imagination is here, a lot of uh, businesses will be over overtaken by machines. And so what does the future hold for, for humans? Right. So that, that, that is a space that we um, kind of work in. Uh, and that is a space that we thoroughly enjoy uh, exploring with leaders. So um, what we figured out is just like there is financial capital, there is also human capital. But now we call it, um, there is an aspect which we call social capital. So social capital is about what happens in between people, the networks that the team creates, is also very important. Right? So where the ideas can flow, uh, helpfulness um, can flow. And I think lots of these very modern businesses and corporates, what they're looking for is, is aspects of how do I um, re-engage my team? How do I get them to ensure that the best ideas come to the surface and they flourish. So what we are doing uh, is, the analogy I'll give you is taking a, a, a cruise ship or a, or a bulk ship you know, on, on top of an ocean. So these, these ships have a big turning circles, right? Yeah. So the, and that's what most of the corporates were, uh, were run as. So very hierarchical, very mechanical. One person gives the orders and it's got to be followed all very the way rigid. through. Very rigid, right? And and so this VUCA world that we're in, you cannot operate in that sense. You cannot operate in that sense. So now the analogy is rather than being a, a cruise ship on top of a water, we have to behave like a school of fish that's submerged inside the water, where the group has in, inherent intelligence within it. Everybody is a responsibility of taking that, that school of fish uh, towards opportunities and away from risks. There is no uh, mechanical, hierarchical leader as such. Right? Anyone, anytime, anywhere can take a leadership position and, and lead the team through um, as, 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 as they are kind of uh, in, in their space. Okay. Uh that was corporate. Now, coming back to a lot of youngsters who are picking up university courses, uh, is there any any uh, stream that you foresee as blooming much more than traditional courses? Or? Um, I don't, not, not so much uh, streams. I, I think the streams in uh, the, the Australian um, uh, government is, is really pushing the STEM. So the... Uh, Science, technology, engineering, mathematics—that that field uh, is 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 a big one. Uh, not to forget, Australia is going to be heavily biased towards heavy resources, and uh, uh, so that's certainly Perth is going to be in that space. So a lot of engineering uh, is is still required. But I I think um, what's what's coming up is. Uh, use of technology, um, use of innovation, use of automation. Uh, so that's a space where I think uh, my focus is in uh, from a, um, if you want to call it verticals, is, is where the, the greatest innovation and growth is going to come from. But I think if I um, uh, cut down all of that uh, to the young person at heart, uh, and I think one of the things I would encourage any young person to do is um, 
learn how to uh, be a really good salesperson. Learn how to be a really good salesperson because it forces you to have empathy for the other person and understand where they're coming from. And that's the best skill you can have in any field, uh, whether it's innovation, whether it's a service orientation, or whether it's something else altogether. It, it is the ability to cultivate uh, uh, empathy for someone else uh, is, is one thing I, I would encourage anyone um, to hold on to. Fantastic. Thanks, sir. It was a very, uh, very good discussion and I'm sure uh, listeners are going to enjoy listening and learning from it. Um, thank you very much for coming in and taking your uh, precious time out on a weekend <laughs> to have this uh, discussion. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much, Adair. I hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you wish to subscribe, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and many more. Please go ahead and share it with your friends and family and anyone who you think will get benefit out of this podcast. For any questions, comment or suggestions, feel free to send an email to us at findyourfeedpodcast at gmail.com. Till the next time, keep smiling, keep listening and keep learning. Ciao for now.